Hey, how's everybody doing this evening? Well, thanks for having me here at Revive. It's um, always a joy for me to come back to spend time with you guys. It's like coming back home for me as well. And, um, you know, I've cherished uh, the friendship I share with Pastor Su Sung. And sometimes it can be a little scary if you're friends with him. You know, uh, I remember coming to your retreat and we do think alike on a lot of things. So when he asked me to speak and I had prepared for uh, sharing from the Sermon on the Mount, and he didn't tell me just the three weeks before you guys were doing the same series on the Sermon on the Mount. And I was super intimidated. Man, I'm, this is now putting me under pressure. So he invited me to do this uh, pulpit swap between our churches, and it's Advent, and we've been doing an Advent series, and I didn't know till a week before we were like, okay, so what are you going to speak on? And I told him, we are doing a series on Isaiah in our church. I said, I'm going to speak on Isaiah 43. And he's like, you got to be kidding me. I'm preaching on the same text, <laughs> which he's probably doing now. So in all probability, when I go back to Spectrum, they may fire me because they're like, oh, we like Pastor Susan. We're all going to go to Revive. You know, so I'll come and join with you guys anyways, right? <laughs> hey, it's just so great to be with you all here. And um, I'm just thankful for this year that God has done some wonderful things in my life and the life of our church and our families. It's been a healing year for us. Uh, you know, a, year, a couple of years ago, I lost my brother-in-law, and, you know, this past year, God really refreshed us in our spirits and did some really cool things. And we are all coming to the close of the year, a time where we look back and reflect on this past year. And, and also, we are looking forward in anticipation for the new year. So, and as I was thinking about this and looking to this passage, I, I came upon this particular passage because when we come to this time, we are looking to God to share with us what is something new that He's going to do in the new year for us. You right? know, as um, I was introduced, so I spent a lot of my time before I became a pastor as a research scientist, and I worked in the field of molecular electronics and the sem semiconductor industry, so I'm always fascinated by what's new that's coming up. And so I follow all the newest gadgets and, you know, the CES show that happens. And, and, and some of the gadgets that are new in the last couple of years uh, that have fascinated me, if you're a tech freak like me, is this is what I, I found was one was a 146-inch TV that's probably debuted, debuted already. You know, I, I have a 55-inch in my home, and 146 sounds not too bad, right? <laughs> Well, I, I can just dream about that, though, because my wife will kill me if I, you know, think beyond that. They, they now have a dolphin underwater drone. I mean, drones were all super popular. Now everyone flies one, but this one can do cool things underwater. They even have a foldable bike you can carry on your backpack. It just comes up in like two to three minutes, and you can ride it and put it back. How cool is that? And for those who are super lonely, they have a robotic dog, you know, a dog, but it's also a robot, so it can like speak to you. I don't know how that works, but these are all new things, and, and new things fascinate people, right? But here we read in this passage, there is a central verse that God is talking to the people of Israelites, and he says, I'm going to do a new thing in your life. And so he's unpacking something for them that I think will have uh, an encouraging message for us this evening. So I'm going to talk about three things from this super long passage that we read. First is the promise that God gives these Israelites. And second is the problem before they can inherit the promise. And third is the proclamation of how they actually receive it. The promise. But before we look into a promise, I think we need to understand the promise giver. I mean, who is it that gives the promise is very important before we can trust the promise that that person gives us. We all know we make promises several times. You know, as parents, sometimes we promise our kids, hey, we'll do this, and then work comes in the way, and, you know, it's not done. Or sometimes in relationships, you know, people promise things and, and then back off. So this part of Isaiah, for a brief background, you know, the first 39 chapters were written to the Israelites before they went on exile. 
And if you read them, some of them is scary language. It's like terrifying. It's like judgment after judgment after judgment where God says you clean up your act or else. And after chapter 39, this, this part of Isaiah is actually written to the Israelites who are already in exile in Babylon. And here the tone shifts completely. And if you start reading the beginning of chapter 43, it is an encouraging note where God is encouraging them and saying, I'm going to revive you. I'm going to bring you back. So as part of doing that in verses 14 to 16, the, God reminds them of who he is. And these are some four characteristics that he talks about in these verses that he wants the Israelites to remember about who he is. You know, in verse 14, he says, Thus says the Lord, your Redeemer, the Holy One of Israel. And he ends in verse 15, he says, I am the Lord, your Holy One, the Creator of Israel, your King. We need to first know the promise giver. It begins with really experientially knowing who our God is. And he lists four characteristics, you know, that he's a redeemer, he's a holy one, he's a creator, and he's a king. You know, sometimes if we have a very unidimensional view of God, or if we just zoom in on one attribute of who God is and define him to be that way, it can be an idol. We can be all messed up. You know, many of you have um, seen our two adopted kids. You know, they came with us to the retreat, uh, Brian and Sophia. But the very first time I got to see them was a black and white picture that was given to us by the uh, social workers. I remember this, seeing the picture of my son, Brian, black and white, and I was conjuring up an image of who this kid is going to be like. And the first time we got to see them in a foster home, he was two years old and he was sitting in a mini couch and we were trying to play ball with him. And even if we throw a ball, he would sit and catch. He would not even get up and move. And we were like, man, is this kid ever going to run? You know, fast forward three years, you know what our biggest problem right now is? To actually make him sit in a couch in one place because he's running all the time. And I keep getting, um, you know, as soon as I finish service, there'll be three people lined up to tell me all the things he did. And I have to deal with that. But I would have never imagined that's how he's going to turn out to be. You know, for us, our understanding of this God sometimes can be a very infant understanding. You know, you grow up hearing a lot about who is God, who is God, who is God. But we miss understanding him in all of his splendor and glory. You know, of the 15 um, most mind-boggling images that NASA published in the last decade, one of them is this awesome picture of a thumbnail-sized picture of the sky that was taken over a period of 10 years and had around 10,000 exposures. And what you see is this beautiful sky with bright spots sprinkled all over, and they said, in just this thumbnail-sized image of the sky, were buried 5,500 galaxies. And that's our creator. It's mind-boggling. So here Isaiah is saying, you know who this God is who is going to promise you? He's your creator. He's not just your creator who created all these galaxies upon galaxies, he is also your redeemer. He's the one who is going to change your life. And he is also the holy one. And above all, he is the king who has come into this world. And he is a faithful God. And the characteristic, the word that keeps repeating in the Old Testament is the word hesed which is the word for grace or faithfulness, the passionate grace that finds its ultimate fulfillment in Christ. And he says, if that's not enough, before I can tell you the promise, I, I want you to know who this promise giver is, but I also want to remind you of what this promise giver has done for you in the past. You know, sometimes when we come through the end of the year, for some of us, it may not have been a great year. 
Might have been a year of failures. Might have been a year where we've lost loved ones. Might have been a year where our dreams came crashing down. And it's all too easy at that moment to sit and lose all hope for the future. And that's the situation the Israelites were in. They're living in captivity in Babylon, which is not fun. So God wants to encourage them by telling them, I want you to look back and see what are the things that I have done. This is not the first time you're in captivity. So in verse 16, he tells them, Thus says the Lord who makes a way in the sea, a path in the mighty waters, who brings forth chariot and horse, army and warrior. They lie down, they cannot rise. They are extinguished, quenched like a wig. Do you remember that? Yes. Your forefathers were in a worse situation than you were, sold as slaves into Egypt, and they were tortured, and they were crying out to be redeemed. And guess how I redeemed them in a mighty, dramatic way? By sending plagues, by splitting the Red Sea, and destroying the most powerful army at that time. That's who I am. That's what is your history. Remember that. Perhaps sometimes when we are in that state, we tend to have a short-term memory loss. We don't remember how God has been at work in our lives. And before we can look ahead, we need to look back. And I'm so glad you guys are doing this booklet of Thanksgiving, which I'm sure is going to be so encouraging for everyone to see how awesome this God has been in so many different people's lives in the past. where God did amazing things to deliver us. And then he says, let me give you the promise which you're all waiting for. I know you want to hear something, and this is the promise I want to give. He says in verse 19, Behold, I am doing a new thing. Now it springs forth. Do you not perceive it? I will make a way in the wilderness and rivers in the desert. You know, this whole imagery of making a way in the wilderness is, is usually referring to when a, a, a mighty king makes a, a visits another country. They try to level the grounds and make the way straight so he can pass through easily. You know, I went back to my home country, India, recently, in my hometown, Chennai, and uh, there is an architectural temple uh, in Chennai that dates back to 6th, 7th century AD. And I've been there several times since I was a kid. Uh, it's, it's the largest megalith in the entire South Asia, but it was never kept properly. You know, you could go there, it's beaten up, and it, it was like they, they claimed there were two other such temples that got buried under the sea due to erosion. But just a week before I went, uh, they had a global summit where the Prime Minister of India met with the President of China because they wanted to revive this historic relationship. And I couldn't believe my eyes as I was driving there. The whole place looked like you were driving down to Washington, D.C. They had cleaned it up. They even had put a, a helipad near that so both of them can come in helicopters and land right next to it. Even my hometown of Chennai doesn't have a helipad. You see, when kings arrive, that's what they're talking about. So when Isaiah is saying, make straight the path, they know what he's talking about. They are looking for a Messiah, someone who is mighty, someone who is more powerful than the Babylonian king and empire to come and deliver them. So Isaiah is using that language, make path, a straight path, because a king is coming. And guess what? The promise is, Yahweh is saying, I'm going to do a new thing. A new thing. If you think all those things I did in the past was amazing, the plagues, the splitting of the Red Sea, destroying the mightiest army, helping you to conquer the land of Canaan, 
and settle down. If you think those were amazing, forget about it. This is going to be infinitely far more superior than anything you have ever experienced in your life. Well, now I'm excited. What could this be? And this is what they've been longing to hear. And he said, when you get this, you're going to be declaring my praise forever in verse 21. And before he unpacks what this new thing is for them, he says there is a problem. You see, before I can tell you what this new thing is, I want to tell you that there is a problem. You know, as soon as you read this, and I've heard sermons like this before, people are talking about God is going to bless you with you know, doubling your fortune this new year. You're going to get a new car. You're going to get a, a new girlfriend. You're going to get, a, get into the best school. You're going to uh, double your uh, profits. That's the way we are thinking because that's where the Israelites were thinking. They wanted someone like Moses to come back again and take them all these worldly problems away. And if you ask people, what are your New Year's resolutions? You know, this is the standard stuff people have. Hey, I want to lose 50 pounds and I want to, um, you know, get a new car or a better job or all of these things, right? I want God to heal me and, and, and then therefore, so, so I'm going to fast and pray and, and try to somehow, it's kind of like bargaining and, and earning it with God. But it's the exact opposite of that. This new, new thing he's going to give us is not based on our religiosity or our faithfulness. In fact, he calls out our bluff in our religious life in the second segment in between verses 22 and 28. He says, I'm going to do this new thing not because you are good, not because you're trying hard to get it. It's in spite of how horrible you are. And let me unpack how horrible you have been, how hypocritical you have been. Let me peel those layers and show you your true heart. He says in verse 22 one words, You did not call upon me, O Jacob, but you have been wary of me, O Israel. You have not brought me your sheep for burnt offerings or honored me with your sacrifices, I have not burdened you with offerings or wearied you with frankincense. And he goes on and on. And he says, but you have burdened me with your sins. You have wearied me with your iniquities. He says, there is a problem. Although you claim that you are my people, although you claim that you want me to rescue you, there is a problem here. Although you are thinking that you are going to earn this, on the contrary, look at your hearts. Your hearts are cold. There is no real worship in your heart. In fact, later on as we read in the Bible, we come to one of the greatest churches, the church of Ephesus that was that had Paul as its pastor for three years. After a generation, another generation came up. And it says, you are neither cold nor hot, and I'm going to spew you out of my mouth. You know, when they are living in exile and generation after generations come, it is possible that somehow, somewhere, they've missed the grandiosity of who God is. And spirituality, true spirituality, got replaced with religiosity and people's heart became cold. And he's asking them, where is that first love you had for me? Where is that first love your forefathers had for me? You're neither hot nor cold. Because the only thing God says he wanted in the Old Testament, everything summed together was love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength and love your neighbor as yourself. Have you loved me like that? Am I your first love? Have I been that for you this entire year? And I'm sure if we are honest with ourselves, we could say no. Then how could he? Give us this new thing. 
I don't know what it was for you in your life this year that took away this first love. You know, it's just, it becomes a routine after a while. You just go through the motions. You're, you're doing the things, but inside your heart is not burning with this love for Jesus. And so he says, he gives the proclamation of the promise. He says, I know you couldn't do anything I had desired. There was no true repentance in your heart when you messed up. There was no desire or yearning to make my relationship right with you. But I'm going to do something. I'm going to do something about that sinful tendencies that we carry in our heart by my own initiative. In verse 25 onwards, he starts, I, I am he who blots out your transgressions for my own sake, and I will not remember your sins. You know, for some of us, growing up, I can speak for this, probably true, in your culture as it is in mine, when you grow up in an Asian culture, which is a performance-oriented culture, you always have to perform to be accepted, right? As a kid, you have, to be, you have to perform to get your sense of worth. And as you grow up, especially living in the Silicon Valley, the biggest idol in Silicon Valley is not any religion or God. The biggest idol in Silicon Valley is success. And though we call ourselves Christians and though we claim we love God, we really love success. Because we have let success define who we are. And success can be different for different people. You know, Charles Taylor, uh, who is a renowned sociologist, uh, had this amazing quote. He said, we define our identity always in dialogue with Sometimes in struggle against the things our significant others want to see in us. Let me repeat. We define our identity always in dialogue with, sometimes in struggle against what our significant others want to see in us. Even after we outgrow some of these, he says, our parents, for instance, they disappear from our lives. The conversation with them continues within us as long as we live. So we are always thinking, even to get my act right with God, I need to do something about it. I need to maybe fix myself. Okay, maybe let me start reading my Bible more. Maybe let me start going on mission trips. Maybe let me start giving more. Maybe this will help God um, to change me. But that's not what is going to happen, Jesus. God says, no. You can't do anything to earn this. I'm going to do this unilaterally all by myself. And he uses some tender words. In chapter 44, he says, Thus says the Lord who made you, who formed you from the womb, and will help you. Fear not, O Jacob, my servant, Jeshurun, whom I have chosen. These are some tenderly loving, affectionate words. He says, I'm going to do a new thing. And you know what is this new thing? I'm going to send you a deliverer who will take upon our transgressions upon him and make God remember our sins no more. One who is better than Moses, Jesus Christ himself, and he will be a new king, and he'll be a king of all kings than one who have seen before. You know, um, I recently finished my first half Ironman, as they were introducing you. It was a crazy experience for me. And usually, it's been like three weeks since I did that. It was in Southern California. People tend to remember the moment they cross the finish line. Like, that's the most exciting thing. You take pictures and you post it on Facebook and all that. But the thing that really is very emotionally significant for me in that race uh, happened very much at the start during the swim. Uh, you know, it was December and it's still super cold. That was just when there was a cold wave that went by and 
the water temperatures were super low in the, in the low 50s. And well, I'd practiced some open water swimming here in Berkeley and we, we have some cold waters here too. So I was quite confident, yeah, I can do this. But then they wouldn't let us touch the water before we swam. And so uh, all of us, when we got in, several of us, including the pros, uh, we had a cold shock and you start hyperventilating when you have a cold shock. And so when you do that, you just have to stop and you know, take, catch your breath and breathe under the water a couple of times and you'll be fine. And, and so it happened within the first 200 yards and I started hyperventilating and I stopped and I saw they have all these volunteers who are lined up in kayaks to, you know, you can go and grab onto them. It's, it's legal as long as they don't move. So I looked out and I saw this um, young man on a kayak and I waved at him and said, hey, can I come and hold on to the kayak? He said, absolutely, yes, you can do that because they care about your safety. And then I said, can you come to me? He said, no, I can't come to you. You have to come to me. I was like, are you kidding me? The reason I'm saying I need you is because I can't swim there. I'm hyperventilating. And I'm sure he had his reasons, right? There's safety stuff, and it's a swimming lane, maybe. And there was like already three, four guys uh, jetting past me to go and hold on to him. And I tell you how I felt that time. I was like, man, I think I'm going to die. I need help. And you're not coming to rescue me. And to me, that was a life-changing moment. And I still eventually had to gather myself and go and held on a couple of minutes and then went and finished it. So, but I was thinking about that. What Yahweh is saying here is, I know you can't come to me. I know you're drowning in your sins. I know you're drowning in your inability to pick yourself up and, and make yourself right. And that's why I'm going to come to you. And that's Advent. And that's Christmas for us, we celebrated. That this creator, this infinitely holy God, this redeemer, this king of all kings, who didn't consider it equality with God, a thing to be grasped upon, but stooped down and became obedient even to the point of death. He was willing to die in my place and your place so that you and I can have life eternal with him forever. Amen? That's the new thing. And he says it doesn't just stop there. He goes on and he says, I am a fear not, O Jacob, Jeshurun, whom I have chosen. I will pour water on the thirsty land. And streams on the dry ground, I will pour my spirit upon your offspring and my blessing on your descendants. <laughs> this new king, he's going to come into our hearts. This glorious creator, redeemer, holy one of Israel, who created these galaxies, he's going to come into our hearts. He's going to give his Holy Spirit into our hearts so we can seek this new king. And that's why Paul says, for me to live is Christ and to die is gain. He says, when this king comes into our heart and we experience that union with him, and as we express this Christ in our daily lives, that is awesome. That is what you need. As we step into the new year, we need an extra measure of the presence of this resurrected King Jesus in our hearts. And God is promising that I am giving it to you. What more do you want? You want a car? I'll give that to you. You want a house? I'll give that to you. But I'm giving you something far greater. I'm giving you myself to come and tabernacle in your hearts so that I can change you from the inside out which you are not able to do. And he gives four aspects of this promise. He says, when I do that, my love will never fail. My Holy Spirit, that is Christ in me, is going to accomplish what you could never accomplish. And it's not just going to stop with you. It's going to go as a covenantal blessing to your offspring. As our children see Christ in us, in our weakness, in our brokenness, how this Christ becomes real, that's a blessing, the best blessing, the best gift we can pass on to our children. I don't know what you guys gave for Christmas, 
what it was under the tree that your kids loved and opened. But I can tell you, they will forget about it in two years. But you know what is the best gift we can give our children that they can never forget? Is when they can see Christ in us. The hope of glory. That's the new thing. And it keeps getting new every year after year after year. Because the Bible says, though our outer body is perishing, our inward man is being renewed into the image of the knowledge of our Creator Christ. And that's far superior deliverance that you want than what you can ever experience in your lives. So in this coming new year, let us pursue Christ, our King, Let us pursue the giver of gifts than the gifts and he will do something new in us. I don't know what it is. Maybe he will give you freedom from whatever it is you're measuring yourself against and feeling short of. Whether you think you're not smart enough or not looking good enough or not working hard enough. Maybe that's the freedom. That's the new thing God wants to give you this coming year as this Christ becomes more real in our hearts. And when that happens, reading God's Word is now not a chore anymore for us. It becomes a joyful experience of communing with Christ, enjoying this union with Christ. Otherwise, you can try all the apps in the world, trying to read the Bible from the front to back or back to front, or now they have like 40 different plans in new version. I'm like boggled looking at all of that. It's not that technology was a problem, that we couldn't read the Bible. <laughs> but when we have Christ, when this new thing begins to happen and starts happening more and more, there's going to be joy in our time with Him and in prayer and in serving Him. And that's my blessing for all of us as we close this evening. May God do this new thing, which can be very different for each one of us in our lives. Can I pray for you? Dear God, we thank you for this evening and for your word of encouragement to every single one of us. Some of us are really tired. We are very physically tired, emotionally drained. Spiritually, we have plateaued and we're just going through the motions a lot and realize there is no passion in our hearts as we used to have. I just pray that you will do a new thing. You will make a new creation out of us as we close out the season of Advent and this year and, and, and look forward to a new year. Lord, I pray that you will speak to us this evening. And you will reveal to us, God, what it is that is holding us back from coming into your presence, from surrendering ourselves and abandoning ourselves on the feet of the cross so you can touch us and lift us up and gently in a caring way as you spoke to us this evening and revive us, Father. I pray for your revival for every single one here at Revive, that it will not just be in their name, but it will be in their hearts in this coming year and in their lives and it will be seen by their friends and their families and their neighbors and the community and that that will draw everyone to you, Jesus. And we pray as we look ahead in this new year that you will create a better version of ourselves because we have Christ in us, the hope of glory. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Thank you.